Mary Flannery O'Connor. Let's talk about her first novel she published coming up today. Would she marry me? (laughs) Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am Wise Crypto. If you are new to these parts, we take some of the most important literature that has influenced even today's writers. If you're down for a conversational approach to literature, hit that subscribe button to join us. And as always, to start off with publication information, Wise Blood was published on May 15th, 1952, when Flannery was just 27 years old. So this book was recommended to us by a friend. Thanks, Zach, for the recommendation. Now, Mary Flannery O'Connor, anyone will tell you that she is a Catholic writer, but not everybody goes to the length to tell you that she is a hysterical Catholic writer. She uses comedy, and she makes you feel her writing. And I don't just mean, like, emotionally. I mean all of the senses in terms of taste, in terms of smell, in terms of sight, her usages of color in her work. It's very easy to feel drawn into the world of Flannery O'Connor's writing. It is important to note that Flannery was diagnosed just a few years before writing this in 1951-1952 with lupus and gave her maybe some type of existential crisis and she looks back on her own religious upbringing and gives us this amazing work, Wise Blood. And when it comes to describing Wise Blood in a spoiler-free fashion, it's incredibly difficult. You can't have apple pie and describe apple pie without mentioning the word apple, right? Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> we can't have a Flannery O'Connor discussion without redemption. A- and that's a huge core of this novel, along with her moment of clarity. A lot of critics will talk about this moment of redemption, this moment of clarity that her characters will experience. It's usually violent. It's usually sudden. And it's usually profound. And sometime as a reader, it's not easy to articulate what that is, even though you feel it. For me, Wise Blood is like a stew. When you first make it, it's all hot and bubbly, and you're all excited, and you get it, and you get that first bite, and it's delicious, right? But then you put it in the fridge, and it marinates, and it gets better over time. And the second time, you're like, wow, this is incredible. And then the third time, you're like, I just, I can't contain myself. That's this book. It just gets better every time I talk about it. And I want to read it again almost immediately. And I think to get maximum enjoyment, it might take a couple of pass-throughs because there is so much to this. And we're not going to get to all of it tonight. And I think Flannery maybe even thought of that herself too. She came back to this 10 years later with an author forward where she talks to The idea of believing in Christ being a life-and-death situation for some people. And I think that's incredibly true because some people can just give it without a passing thought of like, well, I don't care, and that's fine. But to some people, this is their defining moment. This is their moment of clarity that they're searching for. That until they have this figured out, it's like their whole world is just like sucked up into this black hole. They can't look at anything else because they're so obsessed with with finding this one thing and discovering the truth of it. And the truth is something that I think these characters are searching for. In the same way that a lot of Flannery O'Connor's characters do, is they become so obsessed and become single-minded that they don't even see these things and opportunities being presented to them because they're blinded by their own ambition or sin. With that said, she realizes herself the depth of this book, and she was quoted as saying after 10 years that it is a mystery and one of which a novel, even a comic novel, can only be asked to deepen. And this book just deepens and deepens and deepens and makes the deep end look shallow. (laughs) That's how much there is here. (laughs) The best way I can describe it is, is to me the characters feel like one of those blind magnet mazes. Do you you know what a magnet maze is when I say that? Is that the little things you played with as a kid? I remember I had like in the back seat in my grandma's car. (laughs) It's like a sealed box and you have to use a magnet to move these pieces around inside of it. Yeah. And I think the thing about magnets, what's interesting is you can look at two magnets of different polarities. They can look the exact same. You don't know which size which in terms of the positive and the negative. And it's only once you put it near another magnet Do you get a reaction? Mm. And that perfectly describes a lot of the characters in this. They may feel pulled one way, 
but you're not really sure what way they're being pulled. It can say north, it can say south, positive, negative, doesn't mean that you believe it. It's not until you put it near another magnet that it'll either just be repelled in the opposite direction or even slapped together, sometimes violently. And that to me is the crux of Flannery O'Connor's writing is that violent push or crash together that characters have when they meet. I 100% agree with that statement about the characters. And we'll, once we get past the spoiler section, and once we get into the spoiler section, then we can talk a little more about the two main characters and how they interact with one and each other. So if you haven't read this novel, we're getting ready to jump into our spoiler section. But first, a trigger warning for those of you who haven't read this yet. One, if you're highly sensitive to poking at a lot of different of the religious stereotypes or archetypes in there are in the world, Flannery almost grabs every single type of, of religious persona that you can kind of imagine in terms of the, the pleasure Christians or the lip service Christians or even atheists and lip service atheists. She definitely takes a lot of shots at those, and you have to take a little bit of levity into this book when you read it. But also, this book, as Crypto said earlier, came out in 1952. She is in segregation as she's writing this only two years away from integration in 1954. So a lot of the racism and even repelling aspects of humanity, going back to that magnet theory too, are reflected and visible in the story along with usages of the N-word. So if those are hard things for you to digest, you may have a problem with this novel. Typical fashion for Flannery. She's writing what she knows, when she knows, and these are things that were very prevalent in her life in the South at the time. If you've read Flannery before, you're accustomed to the racism and the N-word and all of these things being very, very thrown at you, violence, etc. And something crypto and I experience sometimes when talking with readers is sometimes readers, when they're particularly getting into literature, have a hard time associating with a book when the main character isn't necessarily desirable or likable. And I think this main character may have some of those features. And I think some readers, again, it's something, a skill that you have to kind of learn is to listen to yourself. They'll have a hard time connecting with a novel when you're specifically not supposed to kind of associate or like the main character and you could experience that in this book by no means do i think that's a turnoff but i think that's something that you need to be aware of as a reader yourself when you're diving into a book and i think flannery does a great job that you're supposed to feel that way at the beginning and then question how am i supposed to feel at the end Ooh, get ready get ready all right, moving into our spoiler section here. If you are coming from the live stream that we had over at Leslie's channel, again, we'll put a link to that celebration of this book down below. Let's talk about this book. Kind of, let's, first of all, let's move through kind of a, a loose plot outline because it's this magnet theory of mine that I, I just, it really propelled the novel for me, no pun intended. <laughs> But we start Did you out, gravitate towards it? <laughs> uh, we start out with Hazel Motes, a man so obsessed with nothingness, right? This this idea of there is no God. It's 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 man, and once you're dead, you're dead, and there's nothing else. And another way to describe this is is nihilism, right? And we're trying to figure out, okay, Hazel. Are you really a nihilist? He's presenting, he's telling himself how he believes in nothing and there is no Jesus. But just like a magnet, is that really what he is? Is something that I was constantly questioning throughout this novel. I think you're easily going to be able to convince me that that is not the fact, that he wants somebody to prove him wrong. Well, Flannery writes a complicated character here. Right, And then going out of order, so kind of rearranging this chronologically as a child, he comes up very religious, right? His grandfather was a circuit preacher, a waspish old man with Jesus in his head like a stinger. <laughs> and something we see later on when he goes into the army, of course, is that he brings his mother's Bible. So we know religion is in his family. And he goes to the circus, and this is the first time as a young boy that he experiences this, this perversion, I think, in his innocent view with, with sexuality, where he sees this coffin-like box with a, with a naked woman in it, which is kind of, you know, like I guess it's kind of this strange feeling for a young boy to look at. But what's even stranger 
is when you hear your father's voice there. <laughs> especially Ooh, if you're a heavily, right? ex, especially if you're a heavily religious background, this makes you kind of bring in the young Goodman Brown effect of, oh, these are people that say they're religious and say that they're holy, but are they really p- totally true? And I think we get to see a little bit of that. Well, we all have sin in us, but we don't all air out the sin and and put it in front of us to to uh, pay like penance and then we move into his adult time and when he goes off to the war he brings two items with him and do you remember which two items those were the bible and his mother's glasses and those are two very important items for our story because the bible obviously being a very religious uh, element of the story of him trying to find his own faith or lose his own faith on purpose. And then the glasses, as we're going to see this kind of vision reoccur over and over and over. And there's so many different symbols and similes and everything throughout this story about seeing or vision. And in in particular, him reading this Bible with these glasses as well. And he can't even like see himself in the own mirror at the car dealership too, right? And his name is Hayes, as in, there's a ha- like a foggy haze where it's difficult to see in haze, right? Not chronologically, but in the actual beginning of the story, he's sitting on the train and he's looking out the window and you see this kind of double reflection and you can imagine himself seeing what is going by, but also reflecting upon himself where he doesn't even know where he's going. And it's all very symbolic of what are you seeing as your future? We learn about him through the eyes of a stranger. She's guessing at what type of a person he is, and that's what we're going to be doing throughout the rest of this novel. We never get the curtain fully pulled back on Hazel Motes. Instead, we get all these interactions, and only through those interactions do we learn about his true character. Now, soon enough, we end up in Tennessee, and hilarity ensues in Tennessee. Yeah, but before that, real quick, we have to remember that when he goes to the bathroom, he sees the numbers. Yeah, sees being another you know keyword there, right? He sees the number for Mrs. Watts for a good time. Give her a call. And I think this is interesting because if you're a man who believes in nothing, okay, if you're a nihilist, you don't believe in religion and you don't believe that you're governed governed by these moral laws. You have no morality. There is no sin. There is no guilt, right? So if, if this man is a magnet, and he's trying to figure out, is he truly, you know, the nihilist that believes in nothing, or is he truly someone that does believe and does have guilt for doing things that are considered amoral or immoral? Um, this is a good way to test it. Put a magnet near another magnet, and you will find out what its polarity is. So he's specifically putting himself in these positions like with the prostitute to say, does he have guilt? Does he have remorse to kind of maybe even question Does he have a moral center? Because if he does, then that means he might actually believe in God. This is the Brothers Karamazov problem from Ivan uh, Karamazov, if you will. And the whole scene is absolutely hilarious because you think of, I've never seen anybody actually go and do this. And then eventually he meets Enoch, who is a very peculiar character. And this is where we start to see these connections of the different characters Enoch is a character that wants to have a connection with somebody and is never really able to form that attachment. He lies about being in town. He's been there only a couple of months, but he acts like he's been there forever because he has nobody and he becomes obsessed with Hayes because he wants to form this attachment with him. And it's kind of heartbreaking throughout the story. And then you see this kind of polarity to take your magnet analogy one step further of these two characters of, I almost feel like Hayes and Enoch are antithesis of each other throughout the novel. And then pretty soon we meet Asa and Sabbath Hawks. We don't get their names right away, but it's a blind, quote unquote, blind man and quote unquote, see. his daughter. Right. But what does vision mean here? Because he's constantly bringing up this concept of Paul from the Bible, which Uh, If you don't remember, he was blinded, but it was all kind of with the intent of humility, I guess, in a sense. Uh, It was was a, a way to bring down one's own hubris or pride to submit to a higher authority, if you will. And later on, we kind of get the the reasons behind it, but we learn he didn't actually do it. His words and his actions Mm -hmm. don't line up in the same way that some people, maybe like his father, we don't know, 
where they say they're, you know, one way in terms of religion, but they really act the other way is one of the feelings that I got from Asa. I feel like he really is the representation of the Old Testament sin. We have him kind of compared to Paul, but I also feel like he is somewhat maybe of one of the seven deadly sins, greed or envy, maybe a little bit in there as well, when he starts to see that uh, Hayes is a better preacher when he's not even trying to be. He's like how can this guy just do it so naturally and he's not even trying? That's so not fair. And it's just amazing how Flannery has written these characters so complex that they're hating each other within this novel. Yeah. Well, and then I can see that too with Sabbath, who even has some of that Old Testament hang up too, where she talks about how she was born out of wedlock. She can't make it into heaven, right? Well, that's not true if you believe in the New Testament, right? The New Testament fulfills a lot of the Old Covenant things in the Old Testament. She, much like Asa, is perhaps stuck in the Old Testament as one way to look at it. So maybe these are the type of people that are looking for that that redemption, that are looking for that person to take their sin away from them, in a sense, is one way to interpret these characters. And one other thing to point out that is usually brought up at some point in a discussion about this book is going to be her age of being a young girl. She tries to play it off that she's 15. We really don't know her age. I think everybody's kind of guessing on that, but she is a young lady, and that will be relevant in our story later as we see some of the more interactions between her and Hayes. And eventually we meet Mr. Schultz Hoover. <laughs> like like many characters, like either we don't get their name for a little bit or we get the wrong name at first. I think this kind of, the name has a lot of power in, in the Bible. If you, if you go watch our River Talk, we talk a little bit more about um, Legion and, and driving out uh, the demons, like it's that sort of thing that, that in the Bible, names have a lot of power in a sense. But we eventually meet Mr. Schultz, who is, oh my gosh, he's a hoot, right? Because he's this guy that's just like, dude, you got a really good thing here. Let me help you sell it. Let me help you. Let me tell you how to get the people to believe in this new Jesus. <laughs> He is the guy that is the conductor of the circus. He's like, oh, I see you got talent. I'm going to rope you in because I know that I can exploit what you got going on. And I love how <laughs> subtle that Flannery is with the names of Hazel, Moats, Hoover, Schultz. And mm. again, we bring up the idea of these names and that he is named after a vacuum cleaner that sucks things. And that his last name means pig, so he is a pig sucker. <laughs> and she just she she has these subtle jabs that I love the way that she sets up all of her characters to revolve around how she is going to let basically Hayes kind of go through his Jesus historical heroes kind of journey esque thing. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. And then I don't think this was her point, but technically when it came to Legion that we just kind of talked about, he drove it out, uh, the, the the demon or whatever it was, into pigs, I believe it was too, when you say shoats. I hadn't thought Dang. about that. <laughs> <laughs> it comes full it, circle, right? Yeah, yeah, I hadn't even really... But anyways, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this guy is he like hires a dude <laughs> that just like looks like Hazel and gets, you know, dresses him up like Hazel and then gets him up here to start preaching about new Jesus. And basically there's, he hires a foil for our character, right? Like, like our characters never really drive into themselves. Loneliness pervades this novel. And then Hazel like finally sees pun, pun intended, I guess, in a sense <laughs> himself, but it's this guy that's representing redemption, this new coming. And uh, I, I don't think Hazel takes it very well when he sees this. <laughs> This is great because it's almost like you have a comedy double. You know, like in, in action movies, they have stunt doubles. This is a comedy double. And I, I love how manipulative that, that Hoover is and what he's done because you don't really see this that often of a character that's so kind of diabolical, but funny at the same time because normally you would hate a character like this. <laughs> well, and then uh, he, <laughs> Hazel gets in his car, you know, literally runs down his foil this man <laughs> runs oh, him he hits over the horn <laughs> and the horn's broken <laughs> i then, can see myself doing that 
<laughs> and then hits it into reverse, backs over this guy again, right? With with his vehicle, which we're going to get into, which I think is a symbol in this story, clearly. Oh, yeah, We'll, clearly. we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. But he's he's almost doing this for himself. He wants to prove or kill this vision of himself that is seeking redemption, right? He is a guy that's so obsessed that redemption cannot exist. The symbol, the cross can't exist. To hell with it, to quote Flannery O'Connor at at one point in her life. But he's so obsessed with proving these things don't exist, that he doesn't have guilt, that he's not going to have sin. But when he's put in these situations, like with with Sabbath, you know, and, and potentially taking her, he can't do it. He's he's not pulled towards that. And the problem is, is that he's so obsessed with proving that there is no religion. He's got those quotes, I am unclean, right? And it's because if there is no religion, then he isn't, then he won't experience these things like guilt and sin, the things that his father was kind of secretly exploiting around as a kid, in a sense. These are, this is core and a matter of life and death to him to prove that religion doesn't exist because then he can't have those things. If I think about this of Hazel going through all these interactions and growing as a person, does he finally realize that he does want to be redeemed? And the only way he can be redeemed if he genuinely knows that he has committed a sin because he doesn't believe maybe in just you are born, you have sin because of the sins of his father. And so he says, all right, if I perform this sin then I can know I can be redeemed, and then religion is true mm-hmm. and a necessity. And that's where we yeah. have this character growth arc throughout the whole story, which he tries to become martyr-esque by the end. And like many wow. people, martyrdom is kind of celebrated a lot. It's glorified, right? I think even Asa might have been a little comment on like, oh, I'm going to blind myself, and all these people came out to witness it, right? And so Hazel decides well, I'm going to start walking on rocks. I'm going to blind myself. And I think it's the idea of not necessarily martyrdom, but confusing pain and suffering with the idea of uh, working off your sin, I guess, in a sense, is one way to look at it. And uh, the weirdest part about that, I think, is the cop at the end, right? Before we talk about the cop real quick, this is Flannery's Southern religious upbringing coming out that your pain is equals redemption where you would you know hit yourself or hurt yourself maim yourself in some way in order to have you know breaking the body in order to release the spirit yeah i no doubt about it it's highly subjective one of the ways that i took it because it's just so exaggerated if you didn't know flannery was a cartoonist uh working for the paper when she was younger in school and such so a lot of her characters are exaggerations or hyperboles of the things that she's trying to pull out One of the ways that I took it, I'm not saying this is the way everybody's going to take it, but is a cop's role is to kind of play the arbiter of the law. And to me, this is her kind of pushing that conversation of there is no moral arbiter, anything goes. Well, here comes a cop who's an arbiter of the law, and he's even pushing that story further where he's like breaking the law by destroying his property and just doing whatever he wants. Because if there is no law, anything goes. And even the arbiters aren't enforcing it i guess is one way you could take the cop thing very strange scenario and i'd love to hear what your guys' thoughts are of that down below let's talk about some symbols in the story because it is laden with them there's colors everywhere where yellow you know we talked a little bit in our dostoevsky talk where we talked about how flannery likes to use yellow to represent kind of a little bit of a uh, sinful i guess uh rotting old disgusting type things you know she uses purple all over the place uh, the thing that you just can't deny is her usage of animals in this story, right? Everywhere. Everybody's described as an animal at one point or another. Everybody acts like an animal. They go to the zoo and have interactions with animals. You have a gorilla suit, for God's sake. <laughs> I mean, Enoch literally is a zookeeper guard of sort, in a sense, right? Yeah. In chapter one, we had the women compared to parrots, crows, hens. Enoch in chapter three has a fox like face. Chapter four, the the car that he buys is described as a high rat colored vehicle of sorts, right? And they talk about hyenas and wolves as they're talking about the dirty waitresses and stuff. And that's when he's talking about I am clean. Clearly, we are meant to be drawing some type of parallel to the animal kingdom. 
And Enoch is kind of our guard into that king. Oh, there's that arbiter word again, right? Um, he's kind of our guard into nice. that too. And one of the big differences between the animal kingdom and humans is morality, right? This isn't the first author to explore this. Well, I mean, I guess I'm about to draw the comparison to Clarice Le Selector, Near to the Wild Heart, which came out in 43, and talks about animals kind of being representative of uh, no morality being put on us. But I think Enoch's the one that is meant to explore that the most, right? Because if this is a redemption story, and Enoch from the Bible was one of the few people who were brought directly to heaven in Scripture— you know what what does morality mean when how it governs us because animals aren't bound to that right they're they're very Mm. hedonistic they're very just survival based and we see enoch even kind of exploring that just when he's spying on the women in a sense and just doing kind of what he feels is pleasurable or what he instinctually thinks is right right like these these instincts that he has the wise blood that he has going to the museum (laughs) to get this shrunken body is absolutely ridiculous but it's also instinctual Right. And I think Flannery is doing her character, her cartoonist work on the, the Christians that think that they can just react by instinct and that there is no intellectualizing what's right or wrong in the universe. And animals are are just are just spun up in the narrative throughout this whole piece to kind of make us question that, I feel like. If this book came out today, it would be called DNA. Because Enoch is one of the central characters and you could argue that he's just as much the main character as Hazel and that Enoch represents all of us when you break us down to our core of us just being very sophisticated animals and Enoch here is the one that allows us to view ourselves without having that uh, you know burden of of proving ourselves worthy of what happens to us after we die. Well, we even have quotes like, for example, when he's getting into bed with Sabbath, uh, Hazel, that is, she says, take off your hat, king of the beasts. So again, getting back to that, when you give in to this, this animalistic instinctual behavior, you're giving up your... I don't want to say giving up your morality, but you're eschewing kind of like perhaps some of those things that you might know is right or wrong because Sabbath is, I think we're meant to believe wrong given that we're led to believe that she's probably younger than ought to be doing these types of relations with, right? Yeah, and Enoch too, you know, having the wise blood powers, how do animals pass on their innateness to just know how to fly or know how to survive that's passed on through their blood, right? And he feels like he's more closely connected through his bloodline than any we any human connections that he's made that he's been in town. Well, or his lack of connections, right? Like he's had yeah. no one reach out to him. The first person to read, reach out to him, like he's going to mess with this Ganga creature and he puts out his hand and that's the first time since he's been in town anyone's reached out to him. And I think that, that impacts him emotionally, right? Like he feels oh, that to sure. the point of being like confused where he even like breaks into this truck. I'm not sure Steals what he the does. the gorilla suit. <laughs> Well, I don't even, does, does he do something to the guy in the truck? Like, it's not clear to me whether he hurt that guy in there or not. But he steals that suit and thinks, okay, I just have to dress up in this animal skin and I'll go shake other people's hands since no one wanted to do it. Ganga can do it. And so he puts on the suit to go shake the, the people at the bus stop's hand and they just like take off like, ah! <laughs> And there, yeah, and, and and not only is it like really sad and hysterical all at the same time, but it's another layer that Flannery puts in there of how do we interact with creatures that we see as inferior to ourselves, or how do we interact with these creatures that we think we can sympathize with, or how we can bond or form relationships with our dogs or our cats. It's just another thing to add to this book. There's so much. So let's say we're all born with, with this you know, animalistic behavior. I think that's where the car comes into picture here. We ha- have, quote unquote, well, most people believe we have free will. We, we have free will of choice. Do we have free will of mind, et cetera, et cetera. And how do we apply faith in our lives is a question that we might be asking out of this book. And we see that that Hazel doesn't really have a home, like particularly after he leaves, you know, the family home. Uh, he buys this car, the the high rat colored car. Ooh, there's that, that animal comparison again. And he says this line where he says, I want this car mostly to be a house for me. 
And if he's truly trying to be the nihilist, and this is the car that he's buying, do we call it the nihilistic mobile? I, I, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> <laughs> but That's good. That's put, funny. He is, but he is putting a large question of what is my faith? What, what, what is it that I'm choosing to be? What am I exhibiting? And what do I actually feel inside? Because much like the magnet theory, he's putting out and labeling himself as the I'm clean because there is no God. If there is no God, there is no sin. There is no sin. I have no guilt. But that's not what Hazel feels throughout this whole book. People constantly mistake him for looking like a preacher, or even the cabbie that was taking him to the prostitute. Like, yeah, I don't usually see your kind coming here, right? And every time he's given these opportunities, like with Sabbath and stuff, uh, he he's constantly pulled away towards this faith, this idea that he doesn't believe that there is uh, nothing in this world. And he's trying to convince himself so much that he goes to the point of murder of his foil, trying to kill maybe even uh, symbolically this this alternate version of him. And what does it get him? It leads him into this this broken down state where he's blinding himself, causing pain to himself with the rocks and such that uh, ultimately it kind of leads him to realize that he does believe. And I think he is finding redemption in a very strange way that I think might be hard for a lot of people to connect with. There's so much that goes on with the symbology of the car. A car allows you to travel. It allows you to escape. Um, he puts over value in his car and he, you know, gets, uh, swindled by the, the car. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have Enoch obsessed with his car and wanting to get a car because Hayes has one. Uh, I, I think that this is desire, you know, a car named desire, maybe of what this kind of means for these characters. Well, you'll notice too, even the police officer, when he pulls him over at the end, He's like, why don't you step out of that vehicle? It's a much prettier view out there where if this vehicle is his desire or his, his belief or, or his words of faith in, in nothingness and the cop's saying, why don't you step out of that? And that's when they destroy the car. They destroy his, his false faith in, in nothingness that only then does he finally start to redeem himself too to kind of complete that circle of what you put out in the world versus what you actually believe. 1,000%. This is where I think that Hazel finally starts to realize that truth can also be an opinion. And that breaks him. And he has to move forward where we see later in the story eventually him, you know, maiming himself with using the lime to blind himself so he can try to see and have clarity in life. Say, say a little bit more about what you mean about the opinion side of things. Well, when you are put in the position of being a pastor and you have a responsibility to your congregation and you have this work that you're supposed to interpret and give that information, you are in a position that everybody believes everything that you're spouting is truth. And that might not be the case. And I think that, that in this scene, we finally see that Hazel's realizing for him that might be the case and that to tell the truth all the time he has to limit one of his senses, and that's why eventually he blinds himself. Mm, okay, I can see that. And I can see a little bit of that conversation throughout this whole novel with how they're getting up on cars and they're preaching to everyone about their faith, too. They're, they're selling their faith, in a sense, to others. You know, he grows up in this faith that his parents pass on to him. Uh, I think that's true of, of how do we reflect our faith externally, too, is something that is explored in this novel, interestingly enough. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing, right? There are false preachers, false preachers, false preachers, and he wants them all to be true, like you've said, and he's finally realizing, wait a minute, what if it's just their truth? I can have my own truth. How do I find that? So for a first effort into your writing career, Flannery O'Connor steps onto the scene with blazing fire, with no punches pulled, emotions shot everywhere. What an incredible piece of work. I understand it's not for everyone. This is, this is, this is something that, like I said, you're going to be following around an undesirable narrator. I realize some people have problems with that and they don't even know why. And it's not exactly felt to be true. You have to intellectualize the output of this story. Like you said earlier with the stew. 
you have to let this sit. And I think it's very brilliant when you think about some of these concepts continuing on some of the great questions from all time back, all going back, you know, to, to Dostoevsky, going back to enlightenment of what does morality mean and, and, and how do I apply that and how do I find that in my life? Such an interesting story. Let's move into our subjective wrap up and ratings. We'll leave a Flannery O'Connor playlist down below where we've done tons of her short stories. And if you haven't done her short stories, you must because the story is strong. I, I don't know. Do we say the short stories are stronger? I don't know. I think some people might make that case. What are you going to give this story, Crypto? Ten. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> Ten out of one. <laughs> a thousand. Uh, this is an amazing book. However... I don't think you should start with this book if it's your first foyer into our our girl Flannery. I think that you should check out some of the stor short stories to whet your appetite, to learn her writing style, to acclimate yourself to Flannery's southern world in the early 20th century. And that way, you kind of have a better understanding of what you're getting into. It's not that long of a book. My version was a little over 200 pages. But to go back to our stew analogy again, you're going to get so much more out of it. Like James Joyce or any of those writers that are writing very specific places and times. If you have a little bit more information about her and her style, you're going to enjoy it that much more. Or you might have to read it two or three times. I will because I love the story, and I know that through a second pass-through, a third pass-through, I'm going to get things that I missed. But this book is trying to answer one of those age-old questions of faith versus fact. And where do you get that from? Do you get it from some guy in a pulpit? Do you get it from a book? Or do you get it from yourself? Yeah, I think this is a wonderful book. Uh, easy 10 out of 10 for me as well, I believe. And I think this is one of those things that has maybe put into fewer words than any other author has been able to before. And maybe it feels strange. Maybe it's that cartoonist aspect of the characters. But I think if you if you sit with it, if you live with it and apply that to yourself in your own life, I think it all has purpose. It all has meaning. It might feel lumpy, but just because it's lumpy, does that mean it's imperfect? Does that mean it's bad? No, I, I think every single bit of this is like a potent shot. And I think it's something that is super easy to apply, at least from my personal experience in life. Wonderful story. I agree with you to, uh, completely too that start with the short stories. Not that they're better, but just because I think it's a better way for all the things that you've already said to acclimate yourself to the waters of Mary Flannery O'Connor, one of the greatest writers to have ever lived. Guys, if you are down for literary discussions like this, like I said, we have a playlist down below for other O'Connor talks. We post videos every Monday and Thursday. Hit that subscribe button to join us. Una out. Peace. <laughs>